with this awesome interview with the design team from Apotheosis Studio. Yay! Hi there. Hello. Hey. And good evening, everybody. I'm Liette. I'll be co-hosting with Eggie this evening and quizzing these guys with lots of questions. Ha ha ha. Um, so just to introduce everyone individually, we are very delighted to have with us Daniel. Hello. And Eric. Hi there. And VJ. Hi. And they're coming to us from all over the world, which is really awesome. So thank you guys so much for joining us from everywhere. Uh, we've hit many different continents. So, um, just to go through, we wanted to ask each of you guys to introduce yourselves. So, Daniel, please tell us a little about yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Daniel Weimer. Uh, uh, I'm a game designer. Uh, we've been together for about, what, eight months now. Uh, I'm living in South Korea. I uh, graduated from Full Sail with game design, and yeah. Nice, Very my cool. husband's actually going there. Pretty cool school. <laughs> I've heard good things too. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Eric, how about you? Hi there. Uh, my name is Eric Hankinson. Uh, I am the lead designer at Apotheosis Studios. Um, I'm from South Florida. Uh, I have background in a number of different fields, most notably acting and creative writing. Uh, I'm a published author. Uh, and it's been a great time. Great, great time here with Apotheosis for the last eight months. Very cool. The whole team sounds so happy to be here. It's, it's wonderful to hear. We are. <laughs> And VJ, how about you? Hello, I'm VJ. I'm from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I've been a geek gamer for my whole life, and I have a background in creative writing. And I'm a game designer as well in Apotheosis. Very cool. And as I listen to you more, I'm hearing the accents. Um, That's had a pretty cool. Close friend from Finland, so it is really cool. I yeah. love hearing it again. Well, I have to ask everybody are you gamers? Of course. <laughs> cool. Okay. He's in yeah. Korea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not good fair. at sports. Fair enough. What got you into gaming? Um, I've been playing since I was like three. My parents brought home a Super Nintendo and Super Mario World, and just ever since then I've been playing. Yeah, similar things happened to me too. <laughs> How about you, Eric? <laughs> I think the my first game was probably Warriors of the Eternal Sun on the Master System a long time ago. Uh, so yeah, I've been playing for a very long time. Very cool. Very cool. How about you, VJ? My first gaming system was Amiga. I remember playing, was it Settlers 2 or something like that with it? And what was I, four or five years old? So I've been gaming a long time. It seems like everybody who... Uh... Games has been in it for a very long time. I know it was one of my <laughs> oldest memories. Um, so is that what prompted you guys to want to hop into designing games? Um, for me, I didn't start off wanting to be a game designer. I wanted to be a chef. But okay. uh, I found cooking for other people wasn't very enjoyable. So <laughs> um, one day I was playing Dead Space, and I really liked the design of the game and how, like, uh, well, the experience was developed, and so then I started getting interested in making games. Very cool. How about you, Eric? Um, my, I, I had a background, like I mentioned, in professional acting, and after a while, um, I actually ended up getting diagnosed with lupus, and I couldn't really do the live performance part anymore. I, I couldn't really make dates, and so I started moving more into voice acting. And the place where everybody needs voice actors, uh, and you can really get a foot in the door fairly easily, is video games. Um, so after you know looking around, working on a few projects, uh, I ended up finding uh, falling into apotheosis and having a background in you know being a published author and, and, and writing. Um, they had a, a we have to wear a lot of hats around here, so I just ended up falling into the design team, and uh, it was more serendipity than anything else. That's so cool. That is really cool. Now I have to ask. You mentioned it. What did you write? Uh, I was probably wrote, wrote uh, science fiction and fantasy short stories. Okay. That's awesome. so cool. That is always cool. I'm a huge sci-fi buff. Big old bookshelf right here. Got to quiz you after this. VJ, <laughs> <laughs> so, what got you into designing? Uh, I only became self-conscious about like wanting to do video games for a living like five years ago or something. I, When I was a child, I didn't even think about this uh, career option. 
when I started to grow up more and get more experience, I started to look at games in a way that, hey, I could create thing, these things. And now I'm here. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and we had a really good question. Um, we know that Eric and VJ do a lot of creative writing, but how about you, Daniel? What do you do in the designing piece? Um, before this, I was really into like level design. Uh, in high school, I used to design maps for my friends when we would play D&D. &D. Cool. And so uh, after that, uh, I started just getting into like documenting and stuff because at school, we were taught if you can't tell your idea to someone for them to understand, then it will never be made. So mostly that's what I do these days is just documenting cards and the design that we're planning on doing and stuff like that. Which is really important too. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so we know how you got into the industry. I know Eggie would like to talk to you about designing specifics. Yeah, I I don't have much like knowledge about game designers. So can you tell can you guys tell us what game designing entails? Many things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I guess that was a little Yeah, broad. it's like everything combined together. There, there's very little that doesn't fall under the aspect of game design. Like, um, even like, even things that aren't uh, you wouldn't typically think of that we usually do in everyday. Like, uh, people in other uh, other areas on the team come to us for input on things like UI design. Mm -hmm. uh, we do, you know, the, the the you know the base stuff, the building of the game and how it plays and how how the cards work and whatnot. But really, every element of how the game looks and feels, we at least have some input on, if not total input. So you guys are you like the, power. the magic makers? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, we try to sort through all the mechanics and stuff before we bring it to the programmers, and then we get their feedback, and then ultimately build what we want. Oh, that's pretty cool. So design is definitely a huge imp a part of any game. Um... Uh, so, what's your favorite part of the designing process, though, each of you? Anything specific you like best? Uh, the past couple of weeks, I've been making a bunch of like Easter egg cards, and so it's been pretty fun. <laughs> oh, sweet! That's pretty cool. I, th I think the absolute funnest part is, you know, m more towards the beginning when you actually start getting the ideas and start uh, uh, getting the framework of the thing you're about to create. Mm -hmm. uh, because then you know that th that's when the creativity runs wild, and you get to you get to start coming up with these ideas for how the game is going to play and how it's going to work and how it's going to look, and then you get into actually making those things a reality. <laughs> but uh, the fun part is actually you know laying the groundwork. Yeah, I totally agree. And for me personally, it's uh, when uh, most fun part about design is when you get a like really bad problem that you try to fix, and then you get creative with the team together, you get outside input. And then when you finally fix the problem, it's, it's a good feeling. That's awesome. I, I, I bet when you get it all fixed up and it's working properly, it's a very like, successful, relieving feeling because you're like, oh my god, what's going to go wrong? <laughs> um, so in designing, um, what do you find the hardest part to be and or the easiest thing to? Um, for me, hardest would probably be uh, maybe waiting to see your idea get flushed out. Like in the beginning, you're very excited when you have something, but uh, like, say you want to have something implemented into the game, you'd have to wait a while to actually get to start using it. So that's probably the hardest for me. But easiest is also making those ideas. So it's kind <laughs> yeah. of yeah, well, definitely one of the hardest things is. Um, Having to rely. Uh, this is going to sound bad. Having to rely on the programmers. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, great guys, love them to death. But what I mean is, you know, we can come up with an idea, right, uh, on how something's going to work, and it can work fine on paper. But then we bring it to the program programmers, and they're like, "Well, this isn't really going to fit. This is going to take a ton more money, a ton more time." Uh, the hardest part is finding a way to fit 
you know, your solutions to problems that come up within the scope of what the designers can really accommodate, or the programmers can really accommodate. Hmm. That's definitely something to think about. Everybody having to sync together and it all making it all work. I bet, I bet it's a lot of fun, though. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, VJ? What do you think is the hardest part? Uh, especially if you work on some feature for a very long time, and then you get to see that it doesn't actually work, and you have to scrap the whole thing. It, it might be hard to endure sometimes. Huh. But you'll get through it. You guys are creating yeah, an yeah, amazing yeah. thing here. It gets uh, the feeling of sadness gets overcome by the feeling of sensation by having the new feature which you can play with. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But um, but you you mentioned like mo moving your ideas to the programmer and then getting it made and taken care of and everything working out. On average, how long does it take for that con uh, for that concept to then translate into a finished project? Uh, that depends so much on uh, what feature we're talking about. For yeah. uh, programmers, it's a lot more difficult task. But if we, for example, take artists, they can create sketches mm -hmm. pretty easily. That's cool. I do love your artist artwork. And I know that I, it was mentioned to me that a lot of the North ideas come from Eric. And then... Every, all the you guys, three of you make so much magic happen. I'm sorry, this is just so much fun. <laughs> well, I can start like so tripping liking. over my words because I get excited. <laughs> to, to answer the question, how, you know, how long does it take to go from concept work to finished product? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll tell you when we find out. <laughs> because yeah, well, because here's the thing: is it's never finished. It mm -hmm. really isn't. It, it is if if we were to only stop when we thought it was done, when it was finished, this would never come out. Yeah. Uh, we find a part where we can live with it, you know, where nothing will ever be, f you know, fully polished, you know, in the creator's mind. Uh, it takes as long as we're willing to work on it. That's an mm -hmm. awesome mindset, because then you just get a better and better product, and that's what everybody wants all around. Um, uh, how often have you felt like things needed to be started from scratch? Again, like different ideas, and can you give us examples? How often have uh, we felt? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty often. <off. laughs> <laughs> we try to avoid it whenever possible. I don't think there's anything that we've completely 100% reworked, uh, because again, that's just a, a huge waste of resources. Um, we we try to make things work whenever we can, uh, but. Sometimes there are just some things that the realities of either our budget or our, you know, the limitations of the technology where we really have to go back to the drawing board. Oh, yeah, I can understand budget getting in the way. Budget always gets in the way. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think you got, <sighs> thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, like starstruck no over here. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Shoot. Well, I have a lot of questions about Apotheosis itself. Um, how did you get involved with Apotheosis? Apotheosis Studio. I'm sorry. I did remember the other S. There are two S's in that. Yeah. So, Daniel, how'd you get in there? Um, for me, it started off on Reddit. Um, we had an original okay. group, but the as Victor told during the last interview, the dude who was leading it just kind of left, so uh, he was there to pick up pieces and help us get started, and so we all just signed with him. Cool. Cool. How about you, Eric? Same thing. Uh, you know, like I said, doing, uh, moving into voice acting work from live performance, there's, uh, it doesn't exactly pay well. <laughs> so you have to be in, and have your fingers in as many pies as possible. So, you know, I was, you know, applying to every little tiny, tiny group I could find on the internet that was looking for uh, people to work with, work for them and 90% of them would fold in the first month uh, mm -hmm. and nothing would ever come out of it. Uh, and this is the first group that's actually really stuck together and, and is getting things done and is actually making a finished product that I think I can really be proud of. Awesome. Well, I'm glad everything's sticking. 
Very, very glad. BJ, how'd you get involved? Reddit too? Reddit too, yeah. I was okay. uh, actually, when I first signed up to this, I was supposed to be just for the creative writing, but then as the people in the group got pruned out and we st stuck together, then I got more responsibility in design. Okay, and cool. I'm glad you all found it on Reddit. Go Reddit. Yes. Um, it was very awesome, and um, I have to say, everybody speaks so highly of the team, so just as an FYI, um, tomorrow's Monday, what's your typical day at work? Typical day at work? Um, yes. Uh, love that question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of tough to answer, because it depends on the workflow, um, but usually just reviewing stuff that, for me, I'm reviewing stuff that we did in the past week, and then just trying to... Uh, clean up any issues we might have, as well as continue to jot down ideas for new cards or new ideas for a campaign or something like that. Um, yeah, that's probably my typical Monday. Okay. It's actually Monday here now, so... <laughs> um, yes, that's true. So I should be asking at least a couple of you what you, what you'd be doing today. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, VJ, I know it's early. So Eric, how yeah. about you? Um... First thing in the morning for me would be uh, checking my email or Skype to see who's messaging me upset about what I forgot to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, d daily activities, uh, like I mentioned in the, be the beginning with, I am the uh, the lead designer, which um, is really kind of a misnomer. We're all we're all equals on the team. I'm just more focused on facilitating, making sure uh, things get from the design team to the art team, from the art team to the design team. Uh, making sure that you know any problems that the programmers have with the pie in the sky ideas we come up with are translated into you know our documents and whatnot, and anything that we need to communicate to the programmers is done. Um, um, when I'm not just doing the regular stuff that Dan, Dan and VJ are doing, it's mostly just facilitating. Okay, and that's really important. I know it's got to be interesting to uh, I hate these buzzwords, but keep that synergy. So, way to go there. Um, and BJ, what do you do? Yeah, mostly when I wake up, I start my computer and there's a few hundred messages waiting <laughs> for me on Skype. I go through them, then we'll just, it's a, as Daniel said, it's day-to-day -to -day basis to see what is the most important thing to be done. And yeah, communication is a lot of the work so it's not just uh, being created by yourself and doing the sketches, uh, testing things out, but talking a lot with people, which takes majority of the time. That makes sense, especially being in different places. Um, so we've heard a little bit about how your team works. Um, we've heard everybody is an equal in the team, even though you have different titles. But um, as a group, how do you all feel you work together? I think our design group works pretty well together. Uh, oh yeah, we're great. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone I like else those programs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> also, for our design team, I think it's a bit more unique than for the programmers because uh, we come from all parts of the world, so we all have different cultural aspects which we bring together as well. So we can see things a lot from uh, different point points of view, and we appreciate those views. Do you ever, ever run into a hindrance where um, something is, you're totally normal and it's really not for someone else? Do you Every ever day. Into... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> time zones, man. Yeah. yeah, time zones are a big thing. <laughs> we've, we've had so many problems with time zones. I'm not good with math to begin with. <laughs> and then I have to realize, uh, you know, what do the math on what time it is over in Korea or Finland. And then... Daylight savings time isn't universal. We had that a few, a few weeks ago, and we ended up showing up for a meeting like an hour early, and no one was there, and it was just, uh Yeah, I imagine that would be really not fun. I'm sorry. I, um, I know your pain. I lived in Korea for a year. It's terrible. Uh, at least you were early? Yay? Yeah. yeah. Rather than late. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I hear that a lot of working with the rest of the team at Apotheosis means a lot of communicating and facilitating, getting information back and forth. Um, how do you feel you guys work together? Is it is it really fun to get all of that facilitation done, or what do you think? 
pretty fluent. Um, okay. We all speak pretty well with each other. Uh, we have a constant chat going, and so okay. that's pretty comfortable with them. We've been working with each other for a while now, so any ideas that we want to shoot with them, they'll, they'll look at it, and if they want to shoot something to us, then we take a look as well. Cool. Yeah, things between the design team are great. Uh, these guys, Dan, VJ, I, I love them to death. Uh, like, even, like, these guys I would hang out with once this is done outside of the project. We've really grown as a team, as friends. Uh, I love these guys. They're great. Awesome. VJ so especially. Kind of... Don't know about Dan. Uh, <laughs> oh, poor Dan. I love the Viking. <laughs> oh, but Dan doesn't get an awesome shirt, too. Poor Dan. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. It's all right. <laughs> so, all right, I have to ask, is it ever kind of a bummer to be in different places that you can't just, like, fold up an airplane and throw it at each other? <laughs> you ever have or, those or, or the occasional smack on the head when Dan yeah. does something stupid? Yeah, absolutely. What about this crazy idea that we can't even do? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> and, and, you know, just, you know, practically, you know, there's, there's a lot of str problems with, you know, telecommuting like this. Um, because there's so many times where it would just be like right across from the other person to be able to talk to them and like show them precisely what you're talking about would benefit us greatly. We would save a lot of time, but it's just the reality of us, you know, having to work like this. And it's like th th there are definitely benefits benefits to it too. I mean, we never would have had VJ, Hannah, any of our international uh, team members, you know, in a traditional setting, and getting their input and their perspective uh, is really vital. And invaluable to our team and getting the project project finished. Well, awesome. Sounds like you have all unique and extremely valuable, as you said, teammates uh, <laughs> who will all pull in their own unique perspective. That's amazing. And I think it's wonderful that you can work so well. I know Eggy has lots of questions about the game itself. So excited about this part. Bring them on. So, um, I uh, just so so I'm remembering this correctly. Uh, I think David mentioned to me, the executive producer, that he was the one who came up with the initial idea of a card game. Correct. Correct. Uh, so, how did you guys feel about this when he first came to you with the idea of like, hey, let's make a card game? Like, uh, how did you feel about bringing Rido to existence? Well, uh, when when it first became a thing, when we were first introduced to the concept, um, Rido was never at least in the beginning, actually intended to be a product. Uh, it was more of a, a team-building exercise, something for us all to work on, to see where our strengths and weaknesses lie, uh, see how well we worked as a team, and really get an idea of what it was, what, what was capable for us to do. And as we started working on it, we decided, you know, as we are building this uh, prototype, that, you know, we weren't going to not go all in. Uh, <laughs> When we started building, we started seeing that there's something you, we actually have something unique here. We might have something special, uh, and it seemed a shame to just you know phone it in. And as we started working on it, and things started coming together, we started to really realize, yeah, this can we can do this. This can be be something that actually people want to play rather than just an exercise, you know. Uh, so it, you know, going into it, it was uh, there wasn't a whole lot of strong feelings either way when we sort of when we started building it. But as things you know, as things fell into place, no, it's uh, it's become a real labor of love. Oh, then that's awesome. And right now, the marketplace is fresh for card games. I mean, all you really have that I can think of names off the top of my head right now is you got Hearthstone just made it big. You've got Magic the Gathering online. So this is like a great market right now for um, online card game play. Um, this is going to be awesome. Um, so tell me, what's your favorite part of the game so far? That's a good question. There are so many yeah. things that I like about the game. That's For fine. example, that because um, it doesn't follow the traditional route of the card games, because we have a game board, actually, which we play the cards in. So that brings another tactical element which you have to account for when you make your play. So I like that myself a lot. Yeah, that's something that's really unique for Rido. That when we started doing like our initial market research and seeing, you know, what else was out there, you know, what do we need to do to make Rido a success? One of the things we noticed was, you know, there's this kind of uh, very, you know, uh, you know, very timid injection of traditional turn-based tactics gameplay into card games. You have things like Scrolls, Decromancer. 
uh, that are inserting those kinds of tactical gameplay elements, but they're doing it in a very limited way. You typically have something that's like uh, basically a three-lane defense mode. Uh, and, you know, one of those things, like we said just a little while ago, is that we wanted to go all in. So if you were going to input tactical elements into the game, why not go all in and make an actual tactical game board to provide that full level of tactical gameplay that's just being teased with these other products on the market? Why don't we just take it to its logical conclusion and provide the, f the final form of that, project, of that product while everyone else is still experimenting with the design? That's awesome. And who came up, that makes me have to ask, who came up with the uh, board game idea to have cards on a board game? And I, I mean on a, on a board, sorry. <laughs> it was well, mostly the group. Um, That's so we were cool. trying to bounce off ideas on how to make the game more tactical. I think it was VJ that suggested having triangle-shaped cards, and after that we just rolled with that. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it was really a uh, um, a logical extension of the triangle-based card idea, because if you with the core gameplay we had, if you're going to have uh, triangle-shaped cards, you needed a differently shaped board, and as the board changed shape, it got bigger, and that's where the idea really clicked. Was okay, well, why don't we have a big board that you can play things wherever you want at? and actually have that t kind of tactical landscape. That's really cool. Um, and I, I love hearing every time you guys say, we came together and did, made this as a group. That's just wonderful to hear. I love the group aspect that you guys have. It's so such a wonderful like family idea. I eat it up. <laughs> so uh, what things do you look forward to adding to the game post-launch, like expansion packs, like what ideas do you have for it then? Anything yet? Well, one thing uh, that we are not excited about having post-launch uh, is the campaign mode. Uh, we've discussed it uh, extensively internally about having a single-player campaign, and it was, you know, originally going to be something of a stretch goal, you know, if we managed to get, you know, adequate funding, managed to actually you know, get a following that we were going to put that in at a later date. And through some intense negotiations internally, we've finally come to the conclusion that we're actually going to have that as a launch feature. We're actually going to have it right in there at launch as a core fu functionality of the game. I We've just came to that decision relatively recently, and I'm happy to announce it right here for the first time oh. on the stream. That's awesome. Ooh. That is an interview exclusive. Thank you so much for that. That'll be exciting. Um, <clears throat> a, a question I've thought of myself, and I've had other people ask me when I've been talking about the game, uh, do you ever think the concept of your game could, w in the future, work for multiplayers on a larger board, like four sides or maybe team play or something like that? That is definitely a possible. Uh, it is not... Uh, we have talked about it, but not extensively because the one-on-one multiplayer needs to function first before we start to create something like that. Oh. It's definitely something that we've considered. I mean, looking at the market, like uh, there's a game mode in Magic the Gathering called Two-Headed Giant that is oh. extremely popular, that everybody loves, that if we were to look at something like that in the future, uh, we provide a solid basis that we think would actually be received well by the market, but again, it's just a matter of how well uh, the core functionality resonates with people and how, you know, really uh, how successful we are out of the gate. That I hope I hope you guys are wonderfully successful out of the gate. I'm, like, crossing my fingers over here for you. But, um, so when the game actually releases or beta happens and people are able to play, um, what at the moment, what designs in the moment do you have in place for how matchmaking will work? This is something we've touched on in the past. Um, we haven't gone too in depth into it yet. Uh, we have some ideas that have been thrown around, but we don't have anything uh, real solid at the moment to, to give you guys. Okay. Well, we, we, we've discussed multiple modes, um, particularly you know with that in mind, is we don't want your casual player just getting stomped, right? Um, so we do have you know your 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 casual unranked mode that's um, going to be dependent on a number of factors how matchmaking actually works in that. Uh, we have systems in place right now; they're still uh, under review, but for balance. 
balancing player decks against one another because every internally every card has a value, right? As a as a uh, as a worth. Uh, that's not something that's made explicit just yet, if ever. But it's something that we we can do to rank decks mechanically. And part of making fair play is making sure that the, all the cards in the entirety of the set are well balanced against one another. Uh, those instances where you have someone who, no matter how much time and how much effort they put in, is just being regularly destroyed by somebody who, you know, maybe put more money in, got more cards, that's a, that's, that's a reflection of bad design. Uh, so that's something that we, you know, is very high on our list of priorities as we go in, getting through to beta, is rigorous card testing and card balancing to prevent that kind of behavior. That's wonderful to hear, because I know going into any game these days, players tend to worry about, oh my gosh, am I going to get put against this guy who's just going to totally wreck me? And then there's a lot of games out there right now that have a pay-to-win aspect that just turns away a lot of players. So if you guys are if you guys are trying to do that, that's awesome. Uh, that's wonderful, a wonderful way to help out your customer, really. Um, so you mentioned that there's going to be ranked play. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's something. Uh, again, we've been looking at and we've been looking at different ways uh, to engage with that. As far as providing, you know, we're, we're absolutely going to have leaderboards, but um, the ranked mode. Something we're looking into is just how how exactly we're going to have it uh, arranged to prov uh, to have really challenging play between players mm -hmm. without uh you, you when you have um ranking systems in various you know competitive games you what you often have have a, a problem with is reaching your skill ceiling and where you're straddling the line between one uh league or or rank or the in the next uh and you find yourself you know you know you'll, you'll win a few matches and you'll get into the next rank and then you you'll, you are just completely out of your league there and you'll lose and lose and lose and get knocked back down and it can be frustrating and disheartening uh we've been looking into some ways uh to balance for that but right now it's not it's nothing set in stone and nothing we can really talk about until we have some more solid data to test on oh yeah i understand it's just it's awesome all the stuff you guys have thought of as you've been making this game like it feels like you have everything covered which is brilliant to hear yeah, um and, and one of the things with that ranked mode uh mm -hmm. specifically uh is we Again, we hate that pay-to-win attitude that's uh, been <laughs> pervasive in the industry. That's created uh, we have companies looking at video games uh, either as services or as schemes. Basically, I don't want to be so abrasive about it, but um, money-generating systems. Uh, whereas before, they used to be products and experiences. Whereas, you know, in I'm not going to name names, though. We can certainly think of your own examples games that are just there to provide annoyance uh, and frustration to encourage you to purchase premium content uh, we're looking into various systems in order to reward regular play so that you can pay what you think is appropriate for your return of, uh, of enjoyment and never be handicapped and one of the ways we're talking about doing this is games in the ranked mode rewarding in-game currency uh, so that so long as you are playing and challenging yourself, you're going to have the ability to buy virtually any in-game item without ever spending a dime if you so choose. If that's how you, if that's, you know, your 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 budget and level of engagement, that's an option that's going to be available to you. That's wonderful to hear that'll be available. Um, and since we're on the topic of ranked and different play types, I know um, tournament's play style has been mentioned to me in the past um, by both uh, uh, David and Victor, if you'd like to elaborate on tournament play as well at all? There's not a whole lot we can really talk to, uh, about on that front specifically right now, mm -hmm. but spe mostly relating to security, um, because we're looking at ways of having remote asynchronous tournament play uh, that will allow anyone anywhere to be in you know, global tournaments um, <laughs> that actually you know, have more or less live events inside the game but again we can't really go into it a whole lot just because it's a it's it's a a, a big security question and i'm probably already going to get uh, a bit of flack from some of the other team members just for bringing oh, it up so I'm, I'm sorry it's okay you don't have to go on anymore but thank you i appreciate it 
But um, moving on then, um, what is most important to you in designing gameplay that will enrich the player's experience? So you can take some time to think about that, don't worry. Ooh, we got you with one. Oh my, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I know it's something that um, you want to think about. Okay, well, what will make this especially fun and memorable to your players? And I'm sort of sorry. That's why I came up with that question. I'm sorry I stumped you for a second. <laughs> Maybe let's rephrase. What about the game makes yeah. it so, so, so special to you when you're playing it and testing it? Well, My... No, please, Daniel, I've been talking enough. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, for me, it's mostly like the wow factor. Like when we get uh, certain plays going off on the board, like uh, in our current alpha build, um, we have a good number of cards in there. And so uh, when there's a, um, a play to be made that, say, uh, you might be down by four points and then all of a sudden you turn it around and capture three cards and you're up ahead. Um, for me, those kind of moments and experiences are, are what I'm most excited about. When suddenly you jet ahead, it just wasn't yeah. expected. That's very cool. Okay, so is unpredictability really cool for you too? Do you like that yeah. as a gameplay factor? Yeah, the RNG factor is pretty cool. Um, but also, like, uh, card management and that kind of stuff, playing ahead, those kind of things, I think that's what really makes our game uh, really unique. We have some different mechanics on how to play, and so, uh, like, one thing I, I think... Victor might have said this last week, um, but we have a different draw mechanic, and so um, it can lead to a lot of different kinds of plays, opposed to like the traditional, you just draw a card each turn, and so I think that really gives it a whole different aspect to the way uh, our game is played. And so, yeah. one of the unique ways uh, that we've you know designed this game as apart from traditional card games, other than the tactical element, is in that draw mechanic, simply because. Um, because traditional card games are dependent a lot on that RNG factor, right? Um, whereas with ours, you can have different elements in place to help mitigate those effects, right? So, like with that draw <clears throat> mechanic, if you have another, if your if, if your opponent has a deck that is designed specifically around uh, what we call a magical mill deck, where they were trying to get your cards out of play without you ever playing them you can choose to draw fewer cards to help mitigate the effect of his deck on yours, right? Mm. So it's no longer, you're, you're not being victimized by his play style, you have to accommodate his play style, right? Mm -hmm. You have to actually think around how he is using his deck against you, as opposed to just, okay, well, I guess this is happening to me. Fair enough. Now, please remind me about the different draw method that y'all are using. Mm -hmm because I don't know that everybody saw the interview last week. So can you talk about that a little? So um, we, we were having an issue where uh, we would just draw too many cards in our hand and basically just burn our whole deck. And so uh, Eric came up with the idea of paying one resource to be able to draw a card. And so uh, the way that our game works is we each turn you gain three resources up until nine is the max. And so... Uh, at the time, most of our cards were a higher cost, so we were having issues with, again, just burning cards when you're uh, overdrawing, and so it really changed the whole thing around. Okay, cool. Uh, good to know. And I am guessing that that's one of the things that you get to audit and review each day, huh? Yeah, Let that's definitely that's something that uh, we have to work on, uh, is, is, is you know, balancing those different effects. Very, very cool. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. It's really important yeah. to keep that balance. Mm -hmm. so awesome. So That's most of what we do is balancing these days. <laughs> yeah, because it's, uh, it's going to be going into beta in a month or so, I think, Victor mentioned. Do you guys know off the top of your head? We can't give any concrete dates at this point. Gotcha. But... Understood. We'll look forward to it when it happens. Oh yeah. So as <laughs> as a fa and as a finisher question about Rido, um, what do you want to leave players feeling after a match in game? The well, the idea that they can do better next time, uh, whether yeah, they won or we'll lost. Play again. Yeah. Even if you lose a game, you should have a sensation of excitement. That even if you got to make that one extraordinary play in there, you should 
be able to remember it. And as uh, we talked about the matchmaking earlier, we try to avoid the fact that you get this player who has put five hundred dollars into the game versus the mm -hmm. person who has hasn't put a single dime. So even if you lose, it shouldn't be a horrible experience. That's Very wonderful cool. to hear. It's it's nice to bring in all of the community. Oh, yeah, that's game. that's that's you know because we have so many different people on the team from so many different places. That's something that we've seriously considered is opening it up to anyone who wants to play, no matter their platform, no matter their income level. Uh, we've I'm not we can't really share specifics right now, but our projected uh, pricing table is extremely competitive, and the logic under that is we're not one of the big AAA companies with a lot of overhead. Uh, we're looking for, it, so long as we have roofs over our head, food on our table, and maybe a little left over to make our next game, we'll keep it open. We'll keep, we'll keep things running. So long as we can f afford the servers, things will keep running. So we're keeping the prices as competitive as possible so that anything you spend on the game is rewarding us and our work, not and 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 uh, ensuring the continued existence of that project rather than paying into us to be John Romero rock stars. Very cool, and I think that's a really, really, really good perspective to keep. That this is about keeping the game running, making sure that you can get groceries. <laughs> but uh, very, very cool, and it shows a huge devotion to the actual continuation and design of the game and keeping it rolling the way you intend it to roll. So that's very laudable. Way to go. Um, we did have some audience questions that I'd like to hit. They're going to jump around a little bit because I didn't catch everybody while we were asking these particular questions. So um, to start out with, we have a question that you might not be able to answer right now, but do you have a general time frame for release on other platforms like PC? And I know you're going to tell me no, but it's playing. Cool. It's planned. The PC version for Steam release is a high priority. Uh, so we can't give any concrete dates, but we definitely want to put it out as soon as possible. Sweet. So it won't just be a mobile game. Yeah, we're not going to have, we hope, an instance like GTA V where it comes out a couple years later. <laughs> It'll be yeah. as, clo as close to the other releases as we can technically make it. Sweet. Sweet. And before anybody asks in chat, they don't know when it's going to be on Steam either. We can't tell you. Thanks for asking. I can't wait, Just to though. help you out. <laughs> um, but that would be the next one. And I don't blame you, because I really want to play this, too. So, oh, yeah. um, And I can answer that one for you, DJ Tor. Anyway, um, Daniel, <laughs> it's a question for you. Why do you look tired? I'm sorry. I know. I woke up a couple hours ago. It's yeah. late afternoon now. Or not late afternoon. It's uh, almost noon. But uh, I had a late night, so... Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Chaljaso? Hmm? Chaljaso? Chaljaso, no. Chaljaso, no. No. Well, I, I can't understand any of that, but... For people who didn't know what we said, she asked if I slept well. I said yes. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you did. I imagine there are lots of late nights, which plays into our next question um, regarding working in different places. Do you guys actually prefer telecommuting at this point as opposed to an office setting? I do, Personally. absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, I don't think uh, any of us here that you're uh, seeing right now, I don't think any of us are wearing pants. <laughs> I don't think that's happening. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Okay. That camera down a bit. Yeah, I can roll out of bed and just smush my face against the monitor and go to work <laughs> uh, without ever actually having to put any effort into it. It's great. Okay, with, and I uh, guess I guess if you're with, opposed to pants, it's even better. <laughs> another thing with the different time zones is we always have at least two people awake. So, like twenty four hours, we'll have our design chat going, which is really nice. Yeah, we can get response to th responses to things. You know, if if you're up at four in the morning at, in your local time and you have an issue, there's somebody we have on the team that we can talk to about it and and, and get a uh, the beginnings of a solution in the pipeline ready for when everyone wakes up. 
It's actually a really good benefit for people on different schedules. I hadn't thought of that. That's really awesome. So there's always an overlap. I love it. Well, now I know not to do a pants check. <laughs> yeah, nobody stand up, please, thanks. Just in case. <laughs> no offense, just don't stand up. <laughs> yeah, we've had that before. It was amazing what that person was wearing. Um, anyway, uh, next fun question about the game. Um, will there not be a rarity scale? So will there not be cards that are particularly harder to get? So there will definitely be a rarity scale for our cards. Uh, for example, we have a what we call a starting deck, what you get when you register for the game. But then the cards you are going to collect, they're in different tiers. So there's the common ones, the rare ones, and the ones above that. And there's um, when you open packs, there's a certain chance of you getting of course, you won't get the high-end cards all immediately. So, even if you can't get them all uh, through by just in-game currency, it will take some time. So, you will have a lot of th uh, things to collect, a lot of cards to try out. Okay, cool. So, just just from the aspect of it will take time, things will be more rare per player, it sounds like, because... Mm -hmm. There's always the yeah, pill you can per drop. Yeah. Cool. And, and and it's entirely possible that you can open a deck and get or open a pack and get, you know, a super rare card, your you know, your very first pack that you bought with in game currency, uh, that you earned without ever spending a dime. It's just unlikely. Mm -hmm. It's all about RNG. <laughs> okay. Cool. So there is a rarity factor, just not super intentional. Got it. Cool. Um, checking for more audience questions. I think we covered them pretty well, which is pretty awesome. Sweet. Um, I had a question that came to me. So, Eric, you're the Norse guy. How uh, I realized that that just kind of permeates the entirety of the game. So I have to ask, from a design aspect, VJ and Daniel, how has working in the Norse perspective um, been for you guys? Is that fun? Do you have to? Do you have to get a lot of reference materials? Daniel, you go first. Yeah, for myself, I had to. I haven't studied Norse mythology or really any mythology since, like, high school, so lots of Wikipedia searching. But, uh, yeah, okay. Eric's been great in helping me uh, figure out, like, um, the lore aspect behind everything, trying to get those spells to to match up with actual events and stuff like that, and so it's been real fun. Cool. So yeah. kind of a learning process. Yeah. And please go ahead, VJ. I'm sorry. So uh, Eric is the Viking of the group. He's our uh, grandmaster, the All Father, who Ooh. checks off all the information. But um, I have some knowledge of the <laughs> Norse mythology myself as well. So it, uh, I know a lot of stuff. So it doesn't all come down as a new thing. Very awesome. And... By calling you All Father, he just called you Odin, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember something. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. Do you have a hat for all this, Eric? A hat? Yes. Okay. Like the uh, typical right. Norse hat. Do you have a hat? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Darn. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. In fact, uh, okay. you know, one of the things, uh, we have um, some very loose guidelines uh, for art a lot of time. We like to keep things as authentic as po as reasonable and still maintain, you know, some, some pop culture touchstones and uh, a, a familiarity and excitability. Um, but, you know, one of the things, you know, on our list of, you know, authenticity was no horned helmets. Oh! Yeah. Well, um. I, think I, I think I can fit in there. Isn't it true that the idea of the Viking horn helmet is just based off, like, almost nothing? It, it was a mistranslation um, from a earlier document uh, where they were described as uh, drinking from the, uh, what's called a kenning, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a... Um, a particular f kind of phrasing used in Old Norse poetry where you would uh, refer to something indirectly. Uh, and in this sense, they were, and, and in this instance, they were referring to drinking from the curved branches of skulls, which meant using um, uh, like uh, uh, ram horns uh, hollowed out as, as, as drinking horns. Uh, and that was mistranslated in a specific way uh, to suggest curved branches of skulls on the helmets, right? Okay. 
So yeah. it was a result of mistranslation. That's yeah, that's one of those little bits of authenticity we tried to bring. Awesome. Which is really, really cool. I'd read that before. I was just curious if you had the hat going on. Um, have an English degree. We had to learn all that stuff. Yay. So, awesome. What has been your favorite piece of Norse mythology to bring into the game? There's one I'm looking forward to, but it's it's, it's going to come further down the line, so I can't reveal it yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, thus far, that you can talk about. We have guns, but we can't talk about them. Okay, bummer. <laughs> no, no, well, I, I think we can figure something out. Um, hmm. Eric's trying. I'm sorry, I'm hitting all those questions. <laughs> Someone asked to. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, again, it, it kind of falls in, in, into that, la that last bit, is uh, just authenticity. Uh, bringing a, a version of this culture uh, that isn't what you see in, you know, the Avengers, um, is getting into the nitty-gritty of uh, what this mythology was actually like to the people who believed in it a thousand years ago. Uh, and when we inevitably expand into different cultures and different pantheons that's something we intend to bring to every culture we we look at and touch on is uh a level of authenticity and respect uh that pop culture usually misses when dealing with cultures that have become kind of caricatures so bringing that to life uh has actually been really rewarding and, and really exciting as, as something for us to do i know on the topic of the um, Norse and all that. I know Victor mentioned that you guys have also thrown around the idea of having cards combo in the future based on like uh, the Norse storylines. I don't can't think talk we've... about that either. Sorry. Well, well, <laughs> well uh, generally speaking, um, card effects uh, are thematic. They're not. They're not you know, one-to-one, -one, but they're evocative or impressionist of uh, various aspects of either the culture or the myths or, the, or various stories. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, it's it's something where if you're familiar with, you know, a particular uh, entity or story within Norse myth, the effect will be kind of intuitive. You'll understand why its effect is what it is. That's so cool. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot again and ask a question you can't answer. Well, I mean, we also have, based off of actual myth, like, synergies between certain cards if they have some uh, historical background, so maybe that's kind of what he was talking about. Yeah, that's, that's what I was asking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which does make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, Victor well, talks a lot. We don't listen to him all the time. <laughs> Did you hear he drew a picture of a giraffe one time? Really? What was it a camel? Oh, I can't wow. remember. Oh, oh he oh, told us God, about that! Yes. <laughs> he what was that supposed to be? I can't remember. I think he said he was trying to draw a giraffe to show how bad he was at drawing, and they all thought it was a camel. I think that was the story I was told. Poor Victor. <laughs> um, well, this is just a general note that you can comment on or not, um, but you mentioned authenticity and respect in regards to the Norse culture. I feel like that really permeates the entire company, the entire team, keeping the authenticity of what you want to do um, as, as high as you can, um, respecting your players, respecting each other. And I think that's awesome. And I just wanted to give y'all a shout out because you just hear that in every single thing you say about this game, keeping up the authenticity and respect, whether it's in design, whether it's in how you treat each other, um, and how you view the industry itself. So that's amazing and way to go. I cannot wait to see your finished product on this. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. That's been one of the most enjoyable parts about these interviews. I mean, our Victor interview, he just talked about his team the entire time. Yes. Could not say enough about you guys, which I'm sure you heard part of it, but you can tell he loves you guys and he means it. It's awesome. And I can see why. Y'all are awesome. I've had a really good time chatting with you about this stuff. So. Me as well, I, yes. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for hopping on here. Um, and to kind of wrap us up, my favorite question um, for the end. What question do you wish we had asked you? Oh. And I know, question. we've asked you so many things. <laughs> yeah, you've covered this up quite nicely. Mm -hmm. I can't think of much. 
Ditto. Thank you. We yeah, no, we managed to, yeah, we managed to get to uh, everything I think we can talk about at this stage. Sweet. Okay, my last fun question. Any shout-outs you would like to make? The rest of our team. Um, <laughs> even the programmers? Uh, even the programmers. <laughs> especially the programmers. The programmers especially the programmers. Raphael, Tiago, uh, TJ, the, they do great work. Uh, Hannah, our art lead, as well as Vin and Carlos, they're great people. And, of course, our marketing team, uh, Ashley, Jordan, Renee. Everyone on the team is just absolutely great. Uh, and it, there's not a single person here that this would be possible without. Also, thank you guys for the interview. And you, really of course, it. absolutely. Shout out to Grievance Gaming and, and, and our lovely hosts here today. Uh, we appreciate it very, very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's really been such a pleasure to talk about the game. And um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. That has been kind of fun to see what we don't do know. Um, All in good I know what to ask later. When we talk to you again, so sweet. Thank you for Looking being on with to us it. tonight. Just loved having you guys on. Well, um, check them out, Apotheosis Inc. You can find them on Facebook. I believe you have Twitter going on. Um, yes. The website itself, last I heard, was um, don't look at, at it yet, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that that's coming along. So we're looking forward to hearing more updates on the game. Cannot wait to hear when beta testing is open. I will look forward to popping it on my phone and checking it out. I'm an excited girl. Thank you guys for all the work you're doing. I know it's going to be a super enjoyable game that we will all love, and I can't wait to play it. Me too. Thank you all for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Have a good night, guys. Good night, everybody.